Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar this evening, um, Spotlight on Treatments for Psoriasis. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to the uh, event. Um, we're just letting uh, people start to join, so uh, thank you so much for your patience as we were uh, letting our numbers get up a little bit um, to get us started, so I think we're ready. And um, for those of you who are listening on our English line, if you prefer to listen in French, just a reminder that we do have a French uh, simultaneous interpretation happening tonight, and the number is on the screen. So uh, you're welcome to um, hang up on the English uh, audio and dial into the French if you'd prefer. Uh, but with no further ado, I'm very excited to get us started this evening by introducing myself. Um, my name is Antonella, and I'm the Executive Director of the Canadian Psoriasis Network. Um, for those of you who don't know CPN, as we're called, uh, we're a national nonprofit organization um, that are dedicated to improving the quality of life and health of people who live with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. And we do that in part by presentations like this one. So again, it's my, um, I'm very happy to, to uh, welcome you all here tonight. Um, some very brief housekeeping that I have to go over before I turn it over to our speakers. Um, this webinar is being recorded in English and French, and it will be posted on our website uh, shortly on cpn-rcp.com. Also, um, all of the English audience will be in listen-only mode for the duration of the session. For French participants who dialed in by phone, please put your phone and computer on mute throughout the session. So that's actually on your cell phone, for example, to actually press the mute button because it, uh, we just want to uh, not interfere with the sound as much as possible. Um, and for questions this evening, um, we'll be holding questions till the end of the session. Um, so if you do have questions throughout for uh, either of our speakers, please do put them in the um, Q&A box or the chat box um, that you have on your screen. And we will do our best to get to all of the questions tonight. Um, I have to also mention that with all of our webinar, webinars and resources, the information in this presentation is general information only. So uh, any personal or specific questions or concerns, um, including the risks and benefits of any treatments or vaccination or, or anything about treatment for you, should be discussed, of course, with your doctor or dermatologist. And similarly, the information shared by our presenters tonight is based on their personal or clinical perspectives and expertise. I also am very grateful to note that this session is um, made possible by an educational sponsorship by ABB. And uh, because we are talking about treatments this evening, um, I want to mention that webinar sponsors don't support product discussion that isn't consistent with the approved prescribing information on the official product monographs, and that speakers who choose to speak about unapproved uses of the product will inform the audience. So that's the, those are the, the basic uh, housekeeping on, on, in this virtual world we live in um, right now. So a little bit about us. Um, some of you may be members already. For those of you who aren't, um, I just want to mention that the information tonight, uh, we, we decided to focus on uh, treatments as a topic because this is a, an area of uh, interest that we always hear about when we do our surveys to our membership. We Every year we um, try to get a sense of what are, what are priorities or what kind of information would be most useful to you. So last year we had a series of spotlight events including on diet and mental health and those are up on our website. Tonight we're going to be talking about treatments because that's, this is a big area that um, we, we get a lot of interest about and, and people want to hear more about. So we're very lucky to have our, our speakers um, dive into that this evening. Just highlighting our website again, cpn-rcp.com, has up-to-date information regularly uh, there about treatments and about um, all aspects of living well with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. So I welcome you to um, check it out. Join us as a member if you're not already. It's free and it's um, easy to do right on our website. Um, I also want to emphasize the fact that everybody who's listening tonight to tonight's session is coming from a different perspective. So some people may have milder symptoms, um, some people may have more severe uh, experiences and may have um, experiences with uh, all treatments for psoriasis. So this is a very, it's, a, it's an overview and, and uh, it will be talking about um, what is available in, in Canada for treating the condition, um, as well as talking about 
uh, lifestyle and 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 the complementary ways that um, CPN encourages people to think about um, how to how to stay healthy with these conditions. We'll also talk about how to work with your um, doctor because that's always uh, a shared conversation um, to consider um, what options are right for you. So we hope that wherever you are in your experience, um, there's something there for you uh, in, in the conversation tonight. Again, I invite you to stay connected. Uh, we will have more uh, webinars like this one coming up throughout the year, and we're very excited to be able to um, open registration to our members um, first and then to the broader public. So we encourage you to, um, if you're interested in information like this, to, to stay connected with us. And I'm very excited to um, turn it over to our speakers tonight. So. The, the first presenter that I'm going to be introducing is um, a psoriasis advocate and a CPN member um, who I'm always very impressed, is, is so willing to share her experience. Um, again, everybody's experiences um, with treatments and with the condition are very different and unique, um, but I'm very excited to turn it over to Tammy Waddell to open the presentation up for us because um, she has some unique considerations um, from her her life, but uh, there are a lot of elements that I think you'll find uh, may resonate with you as well in terms of um, what one goes through uh, as they're considering what treatment options are right for them throughout the course of their condition. Um, and then uh, Tammy will be followed by Dr. Irina Churchin, who is a uh, with the uh, New Brunswick Dermatology Center in Fredericton, New Brunswick. Very excited, uh, Dr. Turchin is an expert and um, uh, also uh, always such a great presenter with us. So um, with no further ado, I'm very excited to uh, introduce our first speaker. Um, I also wanna mention that uh, we will be doing some polling tonight just to get a sense of who's joining us. So I encourage you to participate too. So uh, thank you again. And as you have questions, please do pop them into the chat and we'll get to those at the end. So our first speaker is Tammy Waddell. Um, Tammy is a CPN member in New Brunswick who's lived with psoriasis since she was a child. Tammy shares her story through CPN programs like this one to help build awareness about psoriasis and to help others who have severe forms of psoriasis remember that they're not alone. We're incredibly lucky to have Tammy support other CPN initiatives uh, as well, including helping to develop resources focused on women with the condition. We're grateful to have Tammy here uh, with, for her time this evening. And I'm always grateful to her two teenagers who lay off the Wi-Fi while she does presentations like this for us um, so that we can actually hear and see her. So with no further ado, Tammy, thank you for uh, opening this uh, up for us tonight. Thank you, Antonella. Thank you everybody for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I always enjoy talking about the disease as much as I hate having it. Um, but um, it is what it is, and, and I'm here to share my story with everybody. So hi, everybody in, in the world. Um, so I'll just get right into it. So I was 10, um, 10 years old when I was first diagnosed. I believe that it was brought on by strep. Um, I mean, it was almost 30-some years ago when I, when I had it. So I don't think it was all that popular of a disease back then, or they didn't know much about it. So I was just kind of flying by the seat of my pants for a lot of years. Um, I didn't have it very bad. It was pretty, pretty mild, you know, scalp, elbows, knees, you know, the typical places that you would get it. Um, as I got older, you know, my teenage years, it was pretty well manageable with like creams and ointments and tars. Um, I was admitted to the hospital when I first had it as kind of a, a guinea pig, I like to say. They took my tonsils out. Um, I had some light treatment, I had some tar treatment, um, and various creams, and um, it didn't really um, make too much of a difference. Um, you know, it, it settled it down, but obviously it's not going to go away. So after about a month, they sent me home, and I kind of dealt with it myself. Um, my parents, um, throughout my teenage years, it, it got a little bit worse. Um, still, again, I just stuck with the um, the creams and stuff because I was a kid. I didn't want to be taking pills or, and they really didn't have much um, much know about it, know how or what to do with it. And the skin specialist that I seen 
Um, I only seen him the once and that was it. Like, I don't think there was another skin specialist in the city. Oh, did I lose you? Or are you still here? Can you hear me? We can hear yes. you, Tammy. I think uh, okay. you just okay. for a second. Good, good. No, I just want to make sure I didn't lose you. Yeah, it went blank and I was like, oh no. So anyways, as I was saying, so um, up into my 20s, it got considerably worse over the years. But, you know, with work, thinking about kids, all that kind of stuff, I kind of held back on a lot of the more um, evasive treatments. So in my 20s, um, I basically was stuck with creams and the sun, <laughs> the sun was my friend. Um, although I did learn if you get too much sun and you get a sunburn, it's not a good thing to have a sunburn on top of psoriasis. It, it kind of makes it spread a little bit. So, you know, you kind of learn um, what works for you. Um, finding a doctor that you trust and that you like is very important. Um, don't feel like you have to settle, you know, with the first one you see. Um, sometimes it takes a couple tries to find one that you fit with, that you're comfortable with, so that you can share your experience and and share your your treatment decisions, your your you know your different places where you are in your life and how you want to to be treated because you might not be ready to you know to go to the next level to a bigger medication or you might not have the coverage to go to a bigger medication so you know, you know you're kind of stuck in limbo sometimes you feel like and and you feel like there's there's nowhere for you to go but there's always somewhere for you to go you just have to be i guess the word is proactive with your disease you know you have to do as a patient you have to do your homework you know before you go see your doctor and you have to understand your disease almost as much as they do because you know having an autoimmune disease i've learned having more than one that you know it's just a roller coaster <laughs> it's a roller coaster ride a lot of the times and and you kind of just got to roll with it and and really i think the biggest part for me is understanding my disease um and being comfortable with with talking about it to to my doctors to my family to you guys and I find that helps a lot being able to to speak about it. It helps your mind as well as as your as your body. You know, when when you when you feel like you can't talk about your disease, it's it's really hard on on yourself. It's hard on your self esteem because you try to keep it all inside. And I find that's 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 a big trigger for psoriasis. It it seems to feed on that kind of kind of thing, and and it makes it a lot harder. So by the time I hit my 30s, you're not going to believe this. Um, my mid 30s, after I had kids, I was about 70% covered in psoriasis. So I was I was pretty peppered. I know <laughs> I know it's a big number. Yeah, my skin specialist still says, "Oh my gosh, you were so bad. You were so I like I know I was so bad, and it took me to get so bad to realize, okay, I'm done having kids. You know, I'm I'm to the point where I'm in more pain than I am um, not." Just discomfort, you know, the itching, the burning, the pain. You know, you can only use so much cream. It's I was beyond cream. So I decided to take the big jump to a biologic. And, you know, I can't say enough good things about it. You know, it, it does work. It, it took me from 70% to less than 1% in a matter of months. Um, I've been on it since then. God willing, it's it's still working. I've had a few little flare-ups here and there, but um, nothing that couldn't be treated or dealt with with a little bit of tweaking here and there. Um, as for um, you know how how I dealt with it, um, going on it, it was it was a scary decision. You know, it's but I find the more time that goes by, I mean, I've been on it for almost ten years now. The more time that goes by, the more um, advances they're making to these kind of treatments, and and it's just a whole new ball game compared to what it was 10 years ago. It's like taking an aspirin nowadays. 10 years ago, you were like thinking you're putting an alien in your body. So it's uh, it's it's done good things, but everybody has has their own mindset, and it's and the doctors and yourself have to find which road is, is right for you to to travel on you know 
I mean, it's it's the same for men as it is for women. It's not just you know, it's not just you having kids. It's it's you know him deciding if he wants to have kids or how he feels or how she feels. It's it's really it's it's really in how how you see yourself and and where you see yourself and and how how it physically and mentally impacts you know your everyday. It's just one of those diseases that's just every person you might have psoriasis, but everybody has it differently. If that's if that's a way to put it, that's how I see it. Anyways, I've had it for a long, 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 long time, and I know it's not going anywhere. So I know it's part of me, and I've just learned to um, to adapt with it. I mean, everybody has their days, of course, but really, you need to be proactive with your disease. That's that's my probably my biggest, I guess, tip I could say is is to not don't just leave it up to the doctors. They work hard enough. <laughs> you can do some homework and you know get to know your disease. You know, make it part of your, your part of your life. It is part of your life, and it's going to be part of your life. You know, I know now in the last probably three or four years I've been dealing. So you know now I have that to deal with with a little bit of arthritis. So now I have that that's on top of you know on top of skin, skin condition. You know, again, it just, it's just another page in the book. So, you know, you call your doctor, you get a referral to a roomie, you know, you just, you have to just, you have to just um, roll with the punches and, and take it as it is and be strong. People with autoimmune diseases are born with them and they're born strong. So, you know, never give up on yourself. You know, there's always, there's always something you can do and always somewhere you can go and there's always someone that's willing to help you. So that's pretty much me in a nutshell. And um, I really, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> I think I pretty much covered everything um, that, I, that I wanted to say, unless there's something else, Ant Antonella, that you wanted me to talk about. But that's pretty much my life. It's been, you know, the roller coaster. Thanks, Tammy. I think mm -hmm. you do a great job every time of making a huge experience very succinct and very relatable. So thank you I very much. You. Yeah. And and we're, we're grateful to have Tammy, too, because Tammy is a person who's lived several years with um, severe symptoms over time. So she's really experienced, especially for this conversation. Um, she's she's been through a, a lot. She's tried things and she's had to evolve her treatment, like like she said, um, it, through discussions with her doctor um, multiple times because it, it's an evolving condition for many people. So. Um, so we're thank you very much for your your sharing your experience. I'm sure we'll be back to you, Tammy. Um, I hope so. With with questions, yes. Uh, I know you're very willing to share. So thank you so much. Um, so if you want to maybe mute yourself, and then we can uh, turn it over to Dr. Turchin. Um, like Tammy mentioned, again, uh, Dr. Turchin is going to give us a, an overview of of treatments. But again. Um, everybody is at a different place in terms of their their treatment choices and 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 what their options are and what may or may not be um, you know a, a, an actual option for you so hopefully there will be some information in here that's new to you um, and we can definitely uh, answer questions at the end but of course dr. Trichin will have to continue to stay general so we can't really answer any specific questions to your personal condition because it is so personal so um, hopefully it'll spur some good conversation with your doctors like Tammy said if, if you do have good if you do have questions so with that um, I will um, turn it over to Dr. Turchin um, by presenting a brief um, intro to her for those of, of you who don't know her. Uh, Dr. Turchin is a community dermatologist in Fredericton, New Brunswick. She's a dermatology consultant for the Horizon Health Network and assistant professor at Dalhousie and Memorial Universities. Dr. Turchin is a clinical investigator with Probity Medical Research. After receiving her medical degree from the University of Calgary, Dr. Turchin completed dermatology residency training at McGill University in Montreal. She's been practicing general dermatology in New Brunswick since 2009. Dr. Churchin has been involved in clinical research since 2014. She's conducted phase two, three, and four clinical trials investigating uh, clinical trials investigating treatments for psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, uh, hydrodenitis superativa, palmoplantar pustulosis, and act, act, she's testing me here, uh, actinic uh, keratosis. 
In her spare time, Dr. Churchin enjoys spending time with her family, walking her dog, and playing with her grandson, Nolan. And I'm sure you're looking forward to when all the lockdowns are lifted to do even more of that. <laughs> and with that, I'll mute myself and uh, turn the slides uh, up for you, Dr. Churchin. Thank you so much, Antonella. Can you hear me? Yes, I, I hope, can. Yes, perfect. Okay, great. So um, thank you very much for having me. Um, Tami, that was a very, uh, I think, moving um, um, experience for me to listen to the journey. Um, what I'd like to do today is um, to really um, impact on everyone that psoriasis is a journey and uh, we're going to just have a little spotlight on psoriasis but really uh, with the emergence of new treatments it doesn't have to be 70% um, body surface area to really have a great treatment um, so uh, please uh, reach out uh, let's go through the psoriasis and what can be done now and um, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, more questions at the end. And thank you for everyone for joining. It's a uh, late night for some of you. Um, so I look forward to, to hearing from you at the end. So we're going to go to the next slide. My disclosure, so um, doing clinical trials, I've uh, done clin clinical trials with a number of companies. So what's relevant here is Avi that's uh, supported uh, the, the, the night uh, for tonight. Um, but really, I, like, I don't have any preference in terms of the treatment. Next. And I will notify the audience if I choose to speak about unapproved uses of any product. And uh, the presentation is based and consistent on approved uh, uh, prescribed information and product monographs. Next. So what I'd like to do is uh, to go over the psoriasis and uh, what would be uh, important to understand and know uh, associated conditions that we see with psoriasis, but also uh, what's new in terms of the treatments for psoriasis. So first, we're going to go through the polling question. Um, so we, uh, the first question is, what brings you to this webinar? Um, so is this, um, you know, you live with mild psoriasis, severe psoriasis, psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, uh, your healthcare provider, other? And we're back. So uh, we can see that uh, uh, we have a great variety here, a great variety of audience, no healthcare providers, uh, which is probably expected. But many of you live with mild and uh, severe psoriasis, have psoriatic arthritis as well. Uh, I would be curious to know what other is, um, and we can discuss it later at the end. So we'll go back to the slides now. So the next question, how familiar are you with psoriasis treatments? Very familiar, somewhat familiar, not at all familiar. Well, excellent. So um, about a quarter of you are very familiar. So this will make my job really easy, but also very interesting when uh, many of you are somewhat familiar and some of you not familiar at all. So um, let's dive in into the talk and uh, we'll learn about psoriasis. 
Next slide. So psoriasis is a common skin condition, so it affects up to 3% of our population. And uh, as a dermatologist, I would see psoriasis every day, actually uh, many times throughout the day. Um, uh, family physicians, when you talk to them, they may see psoriasis once a month. Uh, so just to give you an idea, so uh, it's really tough sometimes for family physicians to not only recognize, to, but to know all the advanced treatments. Um, black psoriasis is the most common form of psoriasis. Up to 90% of our patients will have black psoriasis. It affects both men and women equally, and it can um, appear at any age. However, a lot of the time, uh, the first signs of psoriasis will uh, appear sometimes around the teenage years, and we always say that the psoriasis will present in this bimodal distribution where some patients will present early on when they're teenagers, sometimes uh, maybe earlier, sometimes maybe a little bit later. And then we do see uh, many patients where their psoriasis uh, presents later in life than on the, uh, when they're 60 or 70. Um, and I've seen babies with psoriasis. I've seen uh, elderly patients uh, with new onset psoriasis as well. Um, let's go to the next slide. I think we might have skipped this slide. Let's try to go back one. No, oh, okay. So psoriasis is a chronic, which means it's long-term condition. It can recur, so it can it can kind of wax and wane. Uh, it is inflammatory, so it's caused by inflammation. And in fact, we know many uh, cytokines or chemicals in the body that drive the inflammation that allows us to actually use uh, treatments that are very selective target in this inflammation. It's not contagious, so a big concern for many of our patients is that they can give psoriasis to somebody else when they touch somebody else. This is absolutely not true. It's not contagious, as many of you know. Um, so um, I, I'm not afraid to touch anybody who has psoriasis. In fact, very happy to give you a hug when you come in. Not now with COVID. Next. So there are um, many different types of psoriasis. So uh, we've, we've discussed that uh, majority of our patients will have black psoriasis. However, we do see gut psoriasis, something what we call erythrodermic psoriasis, inverse psoriasis, and fustula psoriasis. So let's go through the different subtypes and uh, we'll dive into a little bit more details. So black psoriasis is the most common. Um, many of you know how it presents and where it is. So often elbows, knees, scalp, um, and of course can be anywhere. Uh, often the lesions will be thick, they're raised, they're scaly. Um, the, the skin will shed from the plaques and often there will be uh, itch. A lot of the time uh, in the past, we thought that psoriasis is not itchy and that would, that's what would be differentiated from eczema. We know now that it's not the case. A lot of the time, psoriasis can be very, very itchy. And uh, many of our patients will also experience pain as well. Um, bleeding is also not uncommon. Next. Um, so when we think of psoriasis versus normal skin, so normal skin, normally we will see the, the epidermal cells will replace themselves in about uh, 28 days. For psoriasis, it only takes three to five days. So you could see how the skin is turning over so fast. That's why you see so many uh, scales. And what, it, what is also important is that a lot of the time, um, somebody will think, well, you know, I have uh, these flakes, so my skin is dry. So if I use enough cream, it actually will get so much better. I will not have scales. Well, the scales are there, uh, is be it's because of the inflammation. So you could potentially use all moisturizer in the world and you may still have psoriasis. So it's driven by inflammation, not by dry skin. Next. So postural psoriasis is this unique subtype of psoriasis. It can be localized where it can be only on the palms and soles. Uh, but also there is a generalized subtype of psoriasis that can be very serious where it can affect large body surface area. It, it's often triggered by smoke and uh, infections such as strep infection and also stress as well as some medications. Uh, strep is one of the most common infections that will trigger a variety of forms of psoriasis, so just like Tammy mentioned. And uh, the symptoms would include um, 
so you with, with the painful plaques uh, there may be uh, itchy as well but also they will they will appear as red plaque there may be some scale but also there will be many pustules and what pustule is it's basically a little um, uh, little uh, fluid filled uh, pocket except instead of fluid it will be pus uh, and it can develop in any almost any body surface area next Gut aid psoriasis is something that I see more commonly. Uh, Gut in, in, um, in, in Latin, sorry, is a drop. So it's a little tiny drops of psoriasis, usually all over the body, uh, commonly seen in children and young adults, and uh, tends to be uh, not um, as prominent uh, subtype of psoriasis. Usually with time, uh, it will turn around and the skin can clear. However, about... Uh, third of our patients will actually will, will transition to what we call uh, plaque psoriasis and uh, this can persist. Um, it can appear very suddenly after strep throat and in fact it's it's the most common thing. So when I, when we see uh, gut aid psoriasis, uh, we'll, we'll ask, did you have a sore throat or strep throat recently? And um, often it's, it's widespread, it's all over. Next. Inverse psoriasis uh, is a um, fairly common subtype. Uh, here, uh, the quote is about three to seven percent. That would be by itself without any um, other uh, psoriasis variant. But when we see it commonly with, uh, uh, together with the plaque psoriasis as well, and often it will be uh, psoriasis in the folds. So uh, patients will uh, come in and say, well, I have this chronic yeast infection that doesn't go away and it's under my breasts or in the armpit or behind the ear or in the um, gluteal fold in the bum kind of area in the fold or it could be in the groin. And this is inverse psoriasis. So often it, it's not as thick and it's not as scaly, but it's often very red and it can be painful and very, very uncomfortable. Um, and it, it can be exacerbated and triggered by the fungal or bacterial infection. So um, uh, we have to kind of stay vigilant about this and keep that in mind as well. Next. Erythrodermic uh, subtype of psoriasis is uh, fortunately rare. Um, it's when psoriasis affects pretty much almost entire body surface area. When Tommy was saying that she had psoriasis covering 70% of her body, that she would be very close to having erythrodermic psoriasis. This subtype of psoriasis is very serious because uh, it affects a very large body surface area. So the person would lose um, a lot of skin, uh, kind of shedding, um, and, but also it would lead to potentially to chemical imbalance in the in the blood and the person may get really really sick so we take this sub subtype of psoriasis extremely serious this is an emergency for us and um, usually with this uh, the patient will not even feel well um, they may feel shaky cold um, so um, very important to take this seriously and if you know if you feel like you perhaps or somebody who you know head in that way they need to get help and attention right away Next. Okay, let's go through the potential causes and triggers. Um, so there are, there's no one particular trigger that will drive the, uh, the psoriasis. Let's go through the build. There we go. So there are genetic factors. So there are several genes that are implicated in development of psoriasis. And about 30% of our patients will have a family member uh, close in the family who, who have psoriasis. There are immunological factors. So um, we have, when we think of our immune system, we have the adaptive and innate immunity. So the, in, within innate immunity, we have those T cells, and they're very important for fighting infection and cancer. But the same T cells can really cause a havoc in the skin, and they often will drive this inflammation. Um, we also have the environmental factors. So as Tami had mentioned, that if you have too much sun, you may get worse. Uh, if you have strep infection, you may flare the psoriasis. If you have stress, stress is a huge thing for psoriasis. It often will flare psoriasis. But again, there are certain medications, um, alcohol, especially binge drinking, may really flare psoriasis as well. Next. So let's go through the severity. Um, when we think of psoriasis, we often will um, think of it as it could present as mild, moderate, or severe. 
And um, mild psoriasis usually um, classified, looking at the body surface area, where it would be about 3% or less. And how do we know that it's 3%? So if you take your palm, uh, palm of the hand, this will be about 1% of your body surface area. So if you have three palms, you have 3% of um, uh, body surface area involved. Uh, it, it may have significant impact on quality of life, um, but not for everybody. Uh, some, some patients with mild psoriasis find that it's not really that impactful for them. And it's usually managed with topical therapy and uh, routine kind of measures, um, so moisturizing in addition to the skin um, uh, topical treatments. Next. Moderate psoriasis involves more body surface area, so it's anywhere between sort of 3 to 10%. And it can have significant impact on quality of life. In fact, some of the studies tell us that uh, it may have just as much of impact as severe psoriasis. And it really depends on the discomfort, uh, on the extent of the disease, but also where that disease is. So if you have psoriasis on your face or hands or feet, you know, you cannot walk, or if it's on the genital area, um, that, that could be quite significant and can have severe impact. Um, so we often will use topical treatments for, for moderate psoriasis, but um, it may not be as um, effective as for mild psoriasis. So sometimes we'll, we'll have to use other treatments as well. Next. Severe psoriasis, um, will, will, if we take all of our psoriasis patients, will, will affect about a third of our patients. So usually it's more than 10% of the body surface area involved. So more than 10 palms. Uh, and um, somebody may not have quite 10%, but if they have facial involvement or if they have psoriasis on the hands, so they can't really uh, work. Um, they could be on the feet, but you, you, it impact, impacts your walking. Could be the genital area, that also can be severe. And it typically causes quite severe impact on quality of life. Uh, usually it will not be something that would be uh, readily controlled by the topical treatments and will require some sort of systemic treatment. Next. What about associated conditions? So let's go through the poll again. So um, are you familiar with conditions that are associated with psoriasis? Very familiar, somewhat familiar, and not familiar. Excellent. So many of you are somewhat familiar or not familiar. So this will be a um, very important part of the presentation. So we know that psoriasis often comes as a bundle um, as possibly something else. So uh, it can be, uh, be affecting the eyes, though this is quite uncommon. A cardiovascular disease is on our radar as well. Patients with psoriasis may have increased risk. Um, sleep disorders and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, may be another issue. Psoriatic arthritis is one of the common comorbidities. About a third of our patients will have psoriatic arthritis, so it's, it's really high on our radar when we see patients. Depression um, is, is a huge one for us. It's very common among psoriasis patients. Uh, and it, it also comes together with fatigue and disturbed sleep, and sometimes it's, it can be so severe that it can uh, affect the mental functioning as well. Um, so we already touched on cardiovascular disease, but also along with that, there's metabolic syndrome, which associated with diabetes and dyslipidemia. And um, not that it's you know not enough. On top of this, uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis are also associated with the uh, with the psoriasis as well. Next, so let's start with something that we actually see fairly commonly. So psoriatic arthritis is a common uh, comorbidity of psoriasis. So having psoriasis is a big risk factor for psoriatic arthritis. Um, what, what, when we see psoriasis, we know that if there is uh, significant nail involvement, scalp involvement, or involvement of the um, gluteal fold in the, in the um, uh, fold of the bum, 
uh, that would be a uh, higher risk than if you just have psoriasis on the elbows and knees. And injury is a big thing as well. So if somebody has an injury to the joint, they would be more um, likely to have to develop psoriatic arthritis in that joint as well. Um, so psoriatic arthritis occurs in different places and there are many different presentations. It can affect one joint or it can affect several joints. Uh, it can affect small joints and large joints. It could be hands, but it could be also uh, knees and hips. Uh, it could present at the, as pain and discomfort in, at the attachment of the, jo at, of the tendons, um, but also uh, something what we call ductilitis, where the whole finger or toe can be swollen and red and sore. Uh, spondylitis is the inflammation uh, in the uh, vertebra of the spine, so that's another presentation of the psoriatic arthritis. And it can be quite damaging for the joint. So this is something that uh, we want to keep in mind. And when we uh, choose uh, the treatment for psoriasis, we often will keep it in mind choosing the treatment that will help skin, but also the joints. Next. Metabolic syndrome has been linked uh, with chronic inflammation and uh, psoriasis is a chronic inflammatory skin condition. So there's no surprise that the two are linked. And often it's the cluster of these conditions where the person may have high blood pressure, they have, will have high cholesterol, uh, they will have, uh, uh, will have extra weight um, and uh, will be prone to diabetes as well. And all of this comes as a package which we call a metabolic syndrome. And unfortunately, this package is associated with high risk for cardiovascular disease and uh, psoriasis as well. Next. So cardiovascular disease and the risk of cardiovascular disease are important uh, for someone who has psoriasis. We believe that um, somebody who has severe psoriasis is probably at much higher risk than for somebody who has very mild psoriasis. Um, and it's not just psoriasis by itself. So there are other factors to that contribute to this. So it's important to keep in mind that it's, you know, having psoriasis is one risk factor, but also there are other risk factors. So like high blood pressure, diabetes. So um, it's important to keep it all in mind. Next. When we think of the psoriasis and impacts on quality of life, um, it's tremendous. Um, so pretty much uh, any aspect of life you, you, know, you think of, you, you can see the psoriasis impacting that, that, uh, that um, facet of your life. So uh, a lot of the time we think of biopsychosocial impacts. So bio impacts would be the pain and the itch uh, and irritation and um, somebody who cannot sleep. And if you cannot sleep, you cannot really uh, function. So um, you often will feel um, tired and uh, really not feeling like you want to be very engaged with others. Uh, psycho uh, impact, uh, psychosocial impact uh, really impacts the self-consciousness, the feeling of rejection, feeling of helplessness and avoidance of intimacy. And you can imagine if you have psoriasis in the genital area, um, you probably don't want to be uh, intimate with somebody else. And if you're feeling helpless and feeling rejected, um, you probably going to have problems with, in personal life, uh, with, you know, like with partners, with work, pretty much everywhere. And that leads to the, to the social uh, aspect of the impacts of psoriasis. So there's a stigma and that results in the avoidance of social activities and financial challenges and occupational challenges. And um, it, it is always heartbreaking hearing the stories that somebody, uh, you know, could not do their job because they have, they have psoriasis on their hands or um, they have psoriasis on their face. So they were, you know, turned away from work um, they, because, you know, like this person just uh, couldn't be in, let's say, in retail. Um, so this is all really important when we think of treatments where actually this... Um, plays a significant role in our decision-making, how much the impact of psoriasis on the quality of life. And it's important as a patient to convey that impact because a lot of the time, like if, if you don't necessarily mention it, we may not know, especially if it's somewhere hidden, you know, in the, in the genital area, um, some, somewhere where, you know, maybe personal to you and impactful to you, but not necessarily really evident to the physician. 
with all those impacts, uh, patients with psoriasis have high incidence of depression and, of course, anxiety, which is no surprise. Next. And uh, back to the mental health issues. So we know that uh, severe psoriasis is a huge risk factor for depression. And psoriasis in general is a risk factor for anxiety, but also uh, we see increased suicidal ideation uh, with, the, with the psoriasis. Next. So um, very small changes can really go a long way. And uh, so what's important is to kind of stay on top of things. So think of the risk factors for heart disease. So uh, check your cholesterol, uh, you measure your blood pressure, get screened for diabetes, talk to your doctor about this. You need to be a bit proactive, especially nowadays where with COVID, um, everything is sort of on back burner and a lot of uh, uh, people put their health kind of in the back. In, in the back. Um, exercise is important. It's good for, uh, for general health, but it's also good for mental health as well. Smoking is a big thing. And uh, one thing that you can really uh, do good for yourself is to stop, stop smoking. Healthy diet, um, sometimes easier said than done, but super important as well. Um, sleep is important. We often don't, don't think of sleep and ignore sleep, but if we don't sleep well, we don't function well. And then that creates more inflammation and more psoriasis and more discomfort and more pain and more itch. And engage in self-care every day. So, um, and it's little things. Look after yourself. If you can't help yourself, it's really hard to help others. And look after your family and uh, your fr and you know be engaged in, in in social interactions with your friend and at work. Next. So let's go to the most exciting part. So treatments. So I must say that over time, uh, times had changed. So in the past, if we were talking about creams and um, we, you know, we, we really didn't have too many options, we didn't have uh, great medications to help. Now things had dramatically changed in the past 10 years. Um, the, the treatments that we have actually had shown to have uh, significant improvements in quality of life. Uh, these treatments have proven to be safe over time. They have great uh, efficacy over time and uh, often they're quite convenient as well. Next. And this is our evolution of the systemic treatments in psoriasis. So you could see that in pre-2000s, uh, we've had uh, the old medications, methotrexate that we still use. It's a workhorse for treatment of psoriasis. Acetretin, or some of you know it as sorietine and uh, cyclosporin not used as much because of the not so friendly side effect profile. But over time, so since um, um, after the year of 2000, we, did, we started to have these new and exciting great drugs. So uh, first it was uh, etanercept, or many of you will hear about Enbrel. And then there's been more and more medications um, in our pipeline that, that had emerged. And, my, and I must say that in the past five years, uh, it progressed even further. So where in the past we were looking at, you know, 50% improvement, then we were looking at 75% improvement in, the, in, in psoriasis, and we were so excited. Let me tell you now, we're looking for clear, almost clear skin. So when I look at the clinical trials, I will look at 100% uh, improvement and 90% improvement. And that's what I am in my clinical practice with really severe psoriasis. Next. So what about choice of treatment? How do we decide which treatment? So it depends on the subtype of psoriasis, it depends on the extent of the disease, which is a huge factor, um, areas affected, but also where psoriasis is. Uh, age and gender, where are you, like you may be, um, you know, in the point of life where, you know, you maybe pregnancy will be happening, so we need to take it into consideration. Um, other health problems is, well, is there psoriatic arthritis that I need to keep in mind when I'm choosing the treatment? But also lifestyle and occupation, um, certain occupations where, you know, the person perhaps not so much, but have to travel. So I have to choose a treatment that will be friendly uh, to travel. Um, what about the quality of life? Um, if somebody tells me this ruins my life, um, I will take it, um, you know, 10 steps further versus someone who will tell me, I don't really care, this doesn't bother me. 
uh, location. Where are you? Are you very close to the to you know to the office, or maybe you're two hours away? So phototherapy may be a great option for someone when you live uh, close to the to the phototherapy center. But if you live two hours away, there's no way you're going to travel three times a week for 12 weeks to try to clear your psoriasis. Affordability, or we, we say access, do you have access to the treatment? That's number one. Um, can I actually use the treatment that, you know, that, I, that I want? And the uh, patient's willingness to stick with the treatment. So it's not that uncommon where we prescribe a medication and somebody doesn't proceed with it uh, for many good reasons or they will start it and they, they choose not to do it and then they go back to it and it's kind of all over the place so it's really hard to 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 really help with with this when it's kind of on and off next so and when we think of treatment so we always think of topical treatments even for somebody with severe disease unless you're completely clear you may need some sort of topical treatment Phototherapy is a big treatment for us as well. Many patients will benefit from phototherapy and find it very effective. And of course, systemic treatments for psoriasis. Uh, many patients with moderate to severe psoriasis will end up on some sort of systemic therapy. Next. So topical therapy is applied directly to the skin. You know, as a lotion, a cream, or gel, or foam, or an ointment. Uh, it, it is often an initial treatment for most patients, and as Tami was saying, it was a treatment for her for many years, unfortunately, even with severe psoriasis. We use it mostly for mild disease or for disease that is mild while on systemic therapy, and often it, it, it helps. There are a few side effects. It's, it's uh, quite safe, uh, but it requires a lot of work and a lot of patience. Next. And what do we have in, in our uh, topical treatment, our momentarium? So we have topical steroids. So many of you are familiar. Uh, so many of you have heard of beta medicine or beta derm. Um, we have the uh, vitamin D3 analog. So Dovanex, Silkis is another one. Uh, retinoids, not used as often, but uh, still uh, it's in our pocket for, for topical treatment. Uh, Antralin and TARS, TARS are used a little bit more often, but not as much anymore because we have more successful treatments. Antralin is rarely used. And um, combination therapies, we, we use these a lot where you combine two medications to optimize the, uh, the effects of the medications. And we have the Dovobet or Instellar, which is the vitamin D3 analog and topical corticosteroid. And we have the new, new uh, combination therapy called Duobri, which is a combination of topical retinoid and topical corticosteroid. Next. So what's new in topical therapy? So uh, what we usually do with the topical treatment or we used to do is we would say, well, here's a prescription. You use it once a day as needed. So there was this new study uh, that came out in the past uh, year or so. It was a one-year study where um, uh, the, there was an investigation about the proactive maintenance of psoriasis treatment. And it looked in particular the combination of topical uh, vitamin D3 analog and topical steroid. And the patients were basically treated for four weeks. And then uh, one group of patients were ended up on... Uh, not active treatment and the other group of patients were did did end up on the active treatment and it was used the active treatment or the you know the what we call placebo treatment was going to use proactively or reactively so basically once you clear you either um, were to use a medication twice a week and see if you can prevent the flares um, or uh, you use the uh, treatment sort of when you flare Next. And what this study found is that, so when you use the medication proactively, which means that you were kind of maintaining that clearance, uh, you actually had more uh, days uh, in remission. It took uh, 56 days uh, to flare versus 30 days uh, for somebody who, who didn't use that kind of proactive treatment. Um, and number of relapses was also different. So somebody who uh, used that proactive treatment twice a week uh, only had about three relapses per year versus uh, almost five relapses for somebody who did not use that proactive treatment and but rather reactive treatment. 
So, and there was also extra days in remission where the person would not have psoriasis. So they used the treatment twice a week on the chronic area and their psoriasis was more days in not in flare, in complete clearance over a one year period of time. And most importantly, this uh, treatment regimen was quite safe. Next. So the, take, the, the key takeaways was that if we use this proactive maintenance treatment twice weekly, um, we actually uh, did see the benefit and it was a safe treatment. So what we started to do more now, so instead of saying, well, here's prescription and use this treatment uh, once daily and you know, as needed. And what does it really mean with, you know, it's really hard, I find that it's all over the place. So now we actually say, well, use this treatment every day until you clear up or almost clear up. And then if it's your chronic uh, area like elbow or knee, you know that psoriasis is going to come back. Well, use the treatment twice a week and um, you kind of maintaining that clear skin. So um, this potentially may, may be quite helpful um, on those chronic areas. So the exception to this is the sensitive site, so face, groin, armpit. Um, we we generally advise not to do that. So talk to your doctor about this if you know um, if if this is something that you potentially want to consider. Next. Now phototherapy is used fairly commonly for somebody with moderate, sometimes severe psoriasis, and uh, most commonly we use narrow band UV phototherapy. And what it is, so when we look at the spectrum of light, we have the UVA light, UVB light, and UVC light. Um, with UVB light, we know that there's one ray that really helps the skin. So it's narrow band means that we're using just one ray of that UVB. So it's fairly safe treatment. Um, we use it in pregnancy. We use, we can use it in children as well, and um, it really can can be helpful. And what it does, it uh, slows down that rapid kind of turnover of skin cells that we see in psoriasis. Next. A lot of the time I get asked about what about home phototherapy. So it does, um, you know, it does exist. So it can be quite convenient and um, a good treatment, especially if somebody is in a remote area. But there is upfront and maintenance costs. So there's the, there are bulbs. You have to acquire the unit, but also replace and maintain the bulbs. And you need to understand and learn the protocol. Um, uh, it's something that, you know, you're going to have to take initiative. I'm just going to have a sip of water for a sec. There we go. Next slide. What about systemic agents? So uh, we have some medications that are pills. We have injections and we have infusions. So these treatments usually will treat psoriasis from inside out. Remember our immune system driving all this inflammation. So this is how these treatments work. They work on the modulating the, the inflammatory part of the immune system. Um, so we have the uh, oral medications. So methotrexate, you know, many, many of you know really well. Uh, it's commonly used. Acetretinocerite is another one, cyclosporin potential option. And one of our newer medications is Otesla or Apremilast. Yep. Next slide. So systemic agents usually will uh, be used to treat moderate to severe psoriasis. It's often our first step when we look in at the um, moderate to severe psoriasis. Uh, there are many advantages, but also there are many disadvantages. And it's often on the individual case by case basis where we choose the medication. Uh, many of the oral treatments cannot be used in pregnancy. So if this is something that you're planning or considering, please let us know. And the uh, majority of these medications will require monitoring as well. So keep that in mind. Thanks. Biologic treatments are those new treatments that are usually administered as needle or infusion. Um, there are different mechanisms of action and uh, depending on the um, uh, the psoriasis, depending on the comorbidities, we may choose one over the other. Uh, there are 10 uh, biologic agents that are now approved in Canada. So we're very, very fortunate. And we actually have fairly good access uh, for somebody who has uh, severe psoriasis uh, for these medications. They have been around for many years. Some of them have been uh, around for almost 20 years. Um, and um, 
some of them have like you, you some already been transitioning to become a biosimilar medication and we're going to talk about this as well next so um, we already mentioned that uh, so injection or infusion that's how we administer them Usually it's used for patients uh, where psoriasis is severe, but also um, it, the psoriasis does not respond to the oral treatment. Um, it can be used to treat other comorbidities. So some of our medications will also treat psoriatic arthritis and uh, inflammatory bowel disease. So we try to pick one medication that will address all issues. Some of those medications are studied in children and even in pregnancy. So um, if somebody is considering pregnancy, please talk to, to your dermatologist because there may be, may be unique medication that we may choose in this regard. And they're usually very effective and they have a really good safety record as well. Next. Now, remember, so some of those medications have been around for a long time and one medication has been around for a long time. So they, what, what happens, they transition to become generic. So we usually use the word generic when it's uh, a pill, but when it's uh, an injection, we usually use um, the word biosimilar. So that means that they're, because the injections, they are biological molecules. So you cannot recreate something biological to be exactly the same. So you're looking for similarity. So, um, so when those biosimilar medications are produced, there's often a reference biologic uh, that has been around for a while. So one of those biologics would be etanercepto and Brel. Uh, another one that many of you have heard about is Remicade, uh, infliximab. Adalimumab or Humira is another one. So that's uh, now is biosimilar as well. So those the companies that make biosimilar medications, they will compare and create medication very similar to the reference product. Um, yeah, and the, the, often the, uh, the, the reference product has been around for a long time, so it's the sort of the natural progression that happens. Next. So, and often um, there's a big concern, well, are they similar enough? Uh, what's going to happen when I switch? Uh, should I expect any problems? So uh, what we know is that there are no clinically meaningful differences between biosimilar and reference uh, product. Uh, and it's actually rigorously tested in clinical trials and Health Canada has a particular requirement uh, in terms of the similarity. This has to be about, uh, you know, within 10% of the similarity to the, um, to, the, to the reference product. So it's rigorously tested. Um, so it's proven to be biosimilar, and that's the name. And um, there's a big sort of confidence in this in these medications. They should have um, the same efficacy and uh, pretty much the same safety profile to the to the reference product. And uh, you, some of you may hear about this in the next uh, coming months. May, uh, many of the provinces will transition to the biosimilar products. Next. What about treating less common forms of psoriasis? So we've heard about the pustular psoriasis. Um, so this one can be particularly challenging. So it really uh, sort of case by case basis uh, where sometimes it becomes uh, science plus and a bit of an art of medicine, uh, which medication we use, how we control it. So this is with, where you really need a consultation with a specialist and uh, be willing to work with your doctor because often it's a process. It's not a one visit to, you know, you get a prescription. So come back when it doesn't work and have this discussion again. Next. So lifestyle is a big one. So we already talked about stress. Uh, sleep is very important, diet and exercise, because all of it um, works together to really uh, help inflammation or create more inflammation that really affects the skin. Next. And when we look at the uh, sleep disturbances, uh, so they're very common uh, in inflammatory conditions. So we know that in psoriasis, so uh, insomnia or somebody who has difficulty sleeping, sleep apnea, and uh, the restless leg syndrome, they're, they're common uh, occurrences, so more common than in general population. 
So, and when we know that when the person doesn't sleep, there's actually, this creates more inflammation as well. So um, if sleep is a problem, something that you may need to be addressed with the healthcare practitioner. Next. Diet is another big one. So if you could see here, so this is uh, for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. We don't have specific psoriasis diet, but these conditions, remember, they genetically, they're often uh, very similar. So uh, we will recommend very similar diet for somebody with psoriasis. So um, more vegetables, more fruit, uh, more omega-3 oils and fish and um, uh, sort of this healthy diet and less of um, red meat and less of processed foods and uh, those sugary drinks. And it's like, I do find that it's often a challenge. It's one step at a time. It's not something that you can make a change overnight. It's, you know, little steps that, that count, right? Next. Well, let's talk about the, uh, the treatments and uh, how you would work with your doctor to really sort of find the best thing. We often will engage in the, what we call a shared decision making. So when somebody comes in and um, we discuss treatments, I would like to lay out the potential options and I'd like to patients to participate in the care and sort of guide me. So what are you, I often will say, what are your thoughts? What would, you know, what, what are you thinking about this? So I'd like to kind of know what fits with your lifestyle, but also what really is important for, for you in particular. It's also important to return for follow-up appointment. Um, I can only help when the person comes back. If the person doesn't come back, it's really hard to, to help them. Um, we, we often, we, like, we, we don't know if, you, if the person is not back, uh, that they need help. And what also is important is really to discuss the impact of uh, psoriasis on quality of life and the expectation from the treatment. So I, most of the time I can really deliver and, and get you the treatment that would help and work, but I need to know what, what is expected, but also um, how much this really is a problem for you. And have realistic goals. It may not be um, you know, realistic that, you know, um, that there will be a treat, miraculous treatment where there is this magic wand, unfortunately it doesn't exist yet, um, even though we try, we're working on it, right? Um, so realistic goals, uh, there are many great treatments out there, but it's a journey. We, we to find the treatment that works for the particular person that will work with their lifestyle, that will agree with them, that will address other comorbidities. It's a journey. It, it needs some work. Next. So questions that could be asked, so what kind of psoriasis? Many of you already probably know from this presentation. Are there any other information that I could read? There are many great resources out there and CPN would be a great resource. What can be done better to manage my psoriasis? Are there, what treatment options are available? What can I expect? Can psoriasis be cleared or not cleared? Um, with many of our new treatments, um, for somebody who has severe disease and uh, ends up uh, requiring the needle treatment or the biologic treatment, with some of the newer treatments, half of our patients may be completely clear. And um, we expect 80 to 90% of our patients uh, to be almost clear. So we have great success with new treatments. Um, side effects is another um, question that is always on the back of our mind and uh, it's important to bring up to the discussion as well. Next. So be informed, uh, use uh, information to communicate with your doctor, have realistic expectations. Psoriasis will be there, but we have many great successful treatments and uh, don't assume that there's nothing that can be done. Um, sometimes somebody will come in and say, well, I've tried everything. And I'm thinking, well, you know what? We have many treatments that you haven't tried. So, um, and have a positive outlook and uh, help us to help you. Stay engaged, stay, uh, stay present. Next. And that's it. So um, I will uh, welcome any questions. And I'd like to, to thank Tami again for this excellent presentation ahead of me.
Thank you so much, Dr. Turchin, um, for that overview. I think you've covered a long history of treatments, uh, getting us to where we are today um, and keeping us all posted on um, yeah, what, what people um, may, may want to be thinking about or, or may, may have questions for their own doctor about. So thank you so much for your time tonight and for going through that with us. I'm going to see if there are any questions in the um, in the in the uh, Q and A box right now. So we're getting some thank you, thank yous. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, my my dear colleague Marianne. There there is a a question in French. I don't know if you can um, help me with that one. Um, and while you do that, I I will pose one question to Dr. Turchin. Um, just as a follow-up, so we were a little bit late lo logging on, so just if anyone does have to log on right at 8.45, please do, um, but we might just be a few more minutes just to see if we can uh, take any questions. Um, but hi, Antoine. My, hi, Marianne. Um, there's a question in the question box. I'm wondering if you can translate yeah. it for us. Yeah, it's, is there any research on stem cells? That's the question. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, so stem cells has been a sort of a uh, new development, but also not so new development. Um, I must say that I'm not familiar uh, in terms of the research addressing the stem cells in psoriasis treatments, and it probably most likely stems from the fact that uh, we have great treatments uh, for psoriasis right now, and. Uh, and with stem cell research, so there's great efforts to help many other conditions um, outside of psoriasis. So I'm, I'm not familiar with uh, anything kind of happening uh, for, for the psoriasis in, in stem cell research. Um, yeah, but that, that's an interesting question. It is a great question, and I'm I'm happy. I've not I've noted that because um, it's definitely something that we can see how we can look into it a little bit deeper and see what might be out there even just starting um, that we can share back in another way in the future. Um, we have a couple of other questions and I think they're for Dr. Turchin as well. Are there any treatments without side effects? <laughs> um, that's a great question. A life is full of side effects. So, um, you know, it, like this, this is it's just I think it's psoriasis is, is is your life so um, there's always going to be something that you know um, potential adverse event that that you'll see however um, it's often something that again in case by case basis depends on the prior history depends on um, you know what what kind of psoriasis what other you know adverse events were in the past this is something that's managed. So as long as we know, like I find a lot of the treatments, as long as we know what to expect and we monitor and we look for things, uh, it becomes more of a manageable risk, right? And um, so one thing with clinical trials, we're really looking for different sides, of, like different side effects and different, you know, any different developments. And uh, this is looked at uh, very carefully. So to the point where we, um, when we do clinical research and clinical trials, we have to document anything that potentially uh, could be related or unrelated to the treatment. So we will document when somebody sprains their ankle. We will document when somebody has a cold, whether you know we think it's related or not. So uh, when you see these product monographs, you will see big lists of you know potential problems like headache and cold, and and you may think, oh my goodness, I'm gonna have. There's so many people, 60 or 70 percent of people in the study had a cold, but well, what if the study was done in the winter, and uh, colds are common in the winter? Maybe not when we wear masks, right? Um, headaches are generally common in general population. So when, when you have a headache, you often don't think much of it. You take perhaps Tylenol and move on. But when you're in a clinical trial, we have to record it. So I would say, you know, discuss it with your, with your doctor. And there's often a particular uh, question that comes up. So what, what, is, what is actual concern? And we can address that concern, okay? Thank you so much. Um, 
Another question is, so this one is about a specific drug, um, about how long you can use. In this case, it's Dovavet, but I'm going to ask you, um, the question is, how long can you use Dovavet on severe psoriasis? But if you can refrain maybe from <laughs> commenting on the specific drug and just generally on topicals, and, and, I, and I would encourage the person who asked the question, it's a great question for your doctor, uh, make, that, make that time to ask it. I know the appointments are very quick, but it's your time, and Dr. Turchin, you might want to uh, reinforce that um, for, for this individual. It's actually a really tough question uh, to answer because, um, you know, what what is well, how do we define severe psoriasis? Uh, is the treatment working? Uh, how long has the person been using it? There's so many complicating things. Where where is severe psoriasis located? So it's actually for me, it's impossible to answer. I would need to really it's case by case basis, right? So I would encourage. Uh, you to bring this to your healthcare provider and uh, discuss it in more detail. Thank you so much. Um, another question here is, um, with psoriatic arthritis, is there a, a, a beat to consult between dermatologist and rheumatologist? I'll actually pose that to both Dr. Turchin and, and Tammy, like in terms of how do you work with rheumatologist Dr. Turchin when, when a person has PSA as well? So sometimes it's pretty clear when somebody comes in and they have psoriatic arthritis and uh, a lot of the medications that we use actually will treat psoriatic arthritis. So I will not necessarily wait to uh, consult a rheumatologist because time of evanescence and we know that wait times are really is a problem, especially during COVID time. So I will jump on to treatment and select the treatment if I can that will address both problems. And if the arthritis is not well controlled after the treatment that I've selected, I'll actually will consult a rheumatologist and ask them to confirm does the person still have active psoriatic arthritis? Because maybe it's just osteoarthritis, right? Wear and tear. And that we don't we wouldn't expect the the treatment for psoriatic arthritis to work. Um, but it's not uncommon for us. So if there is sometimes there is a concern where I think, well, you know what, this person may have psoriatic arthritis, but really not my call. We need to make sure uh, that we, we, you know, we address this problem. Uh, and I may not uh, need to choose medication for psoriatic arthritis if it's not there. So, um, so I would, then I will definitely consult a rheumatologist. Tammy, I just want to ask if you have any insights from a patient perspective on that, and if you've had to deal with a couple of specialists ever that you want to add. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, no, well, funny with me is that um, probably about, I don't know, five years ago maybe, I was told that I have um, osteoarthritis in my neck and in my spine which never, never bothered me. <laughs> but within the last um, few uh, years or so, like the last two or three years, I've been having joint pain, like in my elbows and my fingers. So I went to my um, family doctor and we got some x-rays and stuff. So there, I haven't really been to a rheumatologist yet. I'm waiting for that. But so we're, we're in the spot where is it osteoarthritis or is it psoriatic arthritis? And um, so it's kind of, they can't really tell one from the other until one's progressed to the point, which I'm assuming is a psoriatic arthritis, until it's progressed to the point to say, okay, it is psoriatic arthritis, it's not osteo. So I'm kind of stuck in limbo right now. I mean, the pain isn't too severe, but it's definitely, you know, some days I can feel it. So I'm stuck in limbo right now trying to figure out, or we're trying to figure out which, which pain is which, I guess. So I'm still waiting to figure it out. And the medication that I'm on doesn't really target um, psoriatic arthritis. So, you know, looking looking ahead, I might need to switch what I'm on if this is what it is. Mm -hmm. So like I said, it's it's a journey. Like Dr. Churchin said, <laughs> you're just on the go all the time. Yeah. Um, totally. And and so there, there are a couple of other questions. Um, one, maybe I'll close with this to Dr. Turchin and then just respond to another in terms of next steps for CPN and, and, our, and our next presentations. Um, the question is, 
does fatigue get better after a month of injection of methotrexate? So maybe if you can speak to that common side effect with methotrexate, Dr. Turchin, or, I or find stress it, medications in general. Yeah. Yeah, methotrexate is, uh, it's, uh, fatigue is one of the common side effects with methotrexate, uh, medication that we commonly use. It can get better with time. Remember to take folic acid. Uh, so we, you, we use the combination of methotrexate. Make sure that you take that. And if fatigue is significant, you need to talk to your doctor because this may be an indication that we need move, to move on. So if somebody has a fatigue and they cannot function, they cannot go to work, they feel draggy all the time, you need to bring it up to, to, to your physician. Because there may be things that could be done. Sometimes we'll kind of, depending on how you take methotrexate, maybe we may change the dosing a little bit or um, just move on altogether. It really depends. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So just looking at the time, I think, um, there are a couple of other questions. One, one very quickly is about the COVID vaccine um, and psoriasis. Um, I, the question is, is it, is it safe to take the vaccine with psoriasis? The general answer, and Dr. Turchin, correct me if I'm wrong, is um, yes, there's, there's no reason for the psoriasis community to have any concerns more than more than in terms of a vaccine. Um, so um, we have an entire presentation on that posted on our website in English and French that Dr. Kirchhoff um, did with us back in March. So I encourage you to check that out if you want more information about the vaccine. Um, but no red flag from our uh, that we are aware of for you. Uh, does that sound anything else, Dr. Kirchhoff? Absol no, absolutely. I encourage all of my patients um, to get the vaccine. And, uh, and there's some questions here about costs when it comes to biologics, which is, of course, a major, um, a major concern because these are expensive treatments. Um, I, I, because there's, depending on where you live in Canada, depending on your private insurance or, or public insurance access and your, your, your personal experiences, how you can access these drugs varies. So instead of going in deep into answering that question, uh, what I'd encourage you to do is check out CPN's website because we have an entire section on how to access treatments in Canada. And you can email us too because I can, um, we, I can help or we can help um, actually navigate uh, based on your specific location and, and the options that might be available to you um, to access, if, if, if there is a treatment that your doctor recommends that you're having trouble accessing, we'll do our best to provide some information to you. Um, that, that I think is it in terms of uh, questions that we can get to. I, I will make sure that any questions that uh, we didn't get to tonight, uh, we provide some resources for in our follow-up email. Um, but it, it is a little bit later than anticipated, so I want to respect everyone's time and, and um, spend another moment thanking our speakers so much for your expertise, your willingness to share, your willingness to make time tonight. Uh, I want to thank everybody who joined the call. I know um, there's, a lot of there's a lot of things that want our attention virtually these days, so I thank you for making time for this one. I hope that you each and every one of you got something out of it to um, consider or take back to your doctor or something new that you learned for future. Um, CPN, again, we are all about providing um, evidence-based information, updating it as, as uh, quickly as we can on our website. So please do stay tuned uh, to, to our, um, our website, our upcoming webinars. Um, if you join our membership, we do have an e-newsletter uh, that comes out. We also have opportunities to be involved. One thing that was touched on by Dr. Turchin is, you know, there is no cure for psoriasis yet, as we all know. Um, that is something that, you know, we also, um, as, as an organization, support efforts towards research for better treatments, for a cure, for better, offer, better uh, resources for people to um, live good, healthy lives. So we have opportunities. Um, for our community to uh, to provide their feedback through through surveys, through programs that we're involved in. So please stay tuned because there is a, a lot of ways to get your voice heard and to get your needs heard that we can hopefully share back and, and encourage research uh, where you need it. Um, so with that, I, I thank you. I, I encourage you all to um, talk to your doctors if you have any questions. Um, that's totally if you have anything else that we can help with I encourage you to get in touch with us 
And, uh, and I thank you so much for, uh, again, for your time. An, an evaluation form will be sent out in the follow-up email. If you have a moment to fill that out, it would really help us to uh, try to continue to improve our process with you. Thanks again, Tammy and Dr. Turchin. It's a pleasure um, Thank you. having you. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. Have a good evening. You too. Thanks again. Bye. Good night to everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.